I think if I'm not mistaken, we have a research software um, at, a research, at AI that's going to be presenting next. So it's going to give us a bit of a wrap up around the state of AI um, today from his viewpoint. And you know, he gets to do a lot of very exciting and interesting things. So I think it's uh, my privilege and pleasure to introduce you, Richard Sarcher, on stage as soon as they take that away from us. <laughs> Thank you, Richard, for being with us. All right, here we are. Hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for sticking around to the end. Super excited to be here today to tell you a little bit about the state of the art uh, of AI uh, as we see it today, and maybe give you a little bit uh, of a look into the future. Uh, whenever we look into the future and you know, we want to understand why is everybody so excited about AI, uh, we actually believe uh, at Salesforce and a lot of other companies that we're at the brink or maybe even in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution. And when you look at the previous industrial revolution, they really significantly changed how humanity operated, what most people did most of their day. And when in 1969, people asked, oh, what's the future going to be in like 40 years? And they asked the experts at the time, maybe the professors who sent the first TCP IP packages uh, across the first version of the internet, the ARPANET, um, zero people at the time, none of the experts at the time, could have predicted that 40 years later we'd have a social media Twitter marketing manager position. <laughs> And just like that, when I'm asked, oh, what's the future, the long-term future of AI, uh, it's really hard for me to really go that far out because the internet will have a, uh, less of an impact than AI uh, will have on the future of humanity. And so we need to have a little bit of humility in how far out uh, we can predict the future. But what is clear is that there's also uh, some amount of hype, and so I want to point out to this really great quote here uh, from 1958 in the New York Times uh, when Rosenblatt, Frank Rosenblatt, uh, just invented the perceptron. And the perceptron is indeed the first basic building block of neural networks, the same kinds of neural networks that nowadays are giving us all the huge advances in AI. And at the time, they were already very excited about that thing, and they often gave uh, estimates of maybe 10, 20 years uh, back then. Uh, about these kinds of algorithms being conscious of their own existence, talk, see, write, reproduce themselves, and so on. And so there's currently no credible research path for self-conscious AI. So despite me being extremely excited about AI, I'm not worried about the self-conscious, self-goal-setting AI because we don't really know even what the missing pieces are. Some people think, oh, but computers will get so fast, we'll have enough neurons to model the human brain, well, we already have enough neurons to model an ant brain, and we still don't have as good robotic control as ants. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a little bit more complicated, but it is also the case that we have made a lot of progress in some of the other verbs like talking, seeing, and writing, and I'll show you a little bit what those will look like soon. So again, whenever you talk about such a hype and use subject like artificial intelligence, it's good to look back at like what the basic definition is of AI. And the tricky bit with that is often that it's actually moving. As soon as we solve something, we don't call it AI anymore. <laughs> In fact, uh, it started with you know, research and folks who worked and looked at each other and said, oh, we're really smart. What can we do really well? And they could play chess really well. They could memorize things really well. They could do math really well. But of course, the computers can already do that. And a lot of the technology that came out of doing that, like playing chess or even playing Go, isn't really that helpful because in game playing, you can play a billion times. If you wanted to use an algorithm that you used to learn how to play Go in medicine, you would first kill maybe a couple billion people, and then you could <laughs> solve some hard medical issues. So the real world can't, unfortunately, be sampled and played against each other billions of times. Not even language uh, can do that. And so uh, basically, we have to look at some functions that we used to not even consider uh, that hard, but they were actually incredibly hard. And now we've solved them thanks to deep learning, such as speech recognition. 
And now we just call it speech recognition or Siri on the phone. Nobody's like, oh my god, it's so amazing. Like, what's the weather in Palo Alto today? And it'll just write it correctly, even with a lot of background noise and different accents and so on. To me, that's still incredible. Every time I say something complicated, I'm like, look, it's, it actually works. Because even five, ten years ago, that was not the case. Uh, but nobody says, oh wow, this amazing AI, look at it. it, it still works. It's just speech recognition now, and that's one of these examples of the moving definition of what AI really is. Uh, another area other than speech recognition where we've made a lot of progress as a community since around 2012 or so is an image understanding and generally in computer vision. And the main idea behind that is an end-to-end -end deep learning models. And what do I mean by end-to-end? -end? It's basically the idea of taking in raw input and having a lot of training examples of some raw input such as pixels and an output that you'd like to predict. And in this case here, you've trained, uh, the first kind of big breakthrough came from training on ImageNet, where we had 1,000 classes and 1,000 representative examples for each of those <coughs> visual classes, like cat, dog, house, car, and things like that. And once you have enough training data, you can train everything from these are the raw pixels to this is a cat. And instead of having humans come up with, well, cats have whiskers and feet and eyes and tails and things like that, uh, you let the algorithm figure out what are all the intermediate representations that you need to understand each visual category. And that idea of end-to-end -end deep learning models has been really, really powerful, and in some cases has even some neurological plausibility. So what you see here, for instance, on the left, uh, these edge blobs, turns out they're also uh, neurons in your brain and your visual cortex that fire when they see certain edges. And there are other neurons that fire other textures and things like that. And so all of these intermediate representations are automatically learned, and that's really, really powerful, because now if you want to classify sheet metal inconsistencies in your manufacturing process, you can use that same algorithm to also classify that. And in fact, there are a lot of other advances that we've made, so before we go into applications, I want to show you a couple of other really cool things that you can now do where we connect computer vision even to natural language processing, we can, for instance, describe images with much more than just a single class. So here you see an algorithm, and in the color coding you see where the algorithm is focusing on in an image while it's generating a specific word. So we can't not just say this is like a human, we can actually say this is a little girl sitting on a bench holding an umbrella. And while it's actually generating the word girl, it is indeed focusing on the girl to generate that word. So this is a very recent paper uh, from last year uh, from my research group. Another amazing new feat of computer vision combined with natural language processing is visual question answering, where we can ask quite complex natural language questions about an image. So we can, for instance, ask, what is the pattern on the cat's fur on its tail? And on the right here, you see where the algorithm is focusing its attention on as it is trying to answer that question. What's amazing, it's actually focusing a lot of its attention on that uh, tail and then correctly answers stripes. And when you look into this and you do some error analysis, which every good AI researcher will do on their development set, then you'll realize, well, the algorithm is actually only around 10 in the beginning and now about 20% better than just looking at the question and predicting the answer without seeing the image. And what that tells you is it captures the priors of language. So if I ask you what's the color of the banana, you can close your eyes and you can say yellow, and you'd probably still be right 90% of the time. Uh, but here we found a couple of examples where it is actually able to overrule that language prior. So what color are the bananas in this picture here on the top right? It actually it focuses on the bananas and realizes those are not quite ripe yet, and actually correctly answers with green. So it's clearly learning a lot of things, and as long as you have enough training data of here's an input, namely an image and a question, and here's an output, namely the answer to that pair, then you can learn to do this for new kinds of images. But not for new kinds of domains. There's, so there's still a lot of work to do. If you never show it a tennis image, it won't be able to answer more complex questions like has the player hit the ball already, or will it, is it about to hit the ball, and things like that. It still needs training data for each domain to work well. Now, there are some real applications for computer vision in industry, and we're seeing a huge explosion in the last couple of years of startups that are focusing 
uh, on specific verticals. So you can have, for instance, this is a billion dollar industry in the United States that people walk around supermarkets, take pictures, and then other people mark up the pictures and say where they see which products. And you can automate a lot of that, and instead of uh, having to manually mark each time you see specific kind of beverage or something, or cornflakes or whatever it is, you can actually have an algorithm identify the products and where they are on the shelves, which can help with automatic inventory management uh, and also with marketing and knowing where your product's actually located. Because uh, if you don't see something in the store, it's unlikely to get bought. You can also have some really impactful applications uh, in oncology and uh, specifically pathology. Uh, full disclosure, I've invested in the startup um, that basically offers a test that used to cost a couple hundred dollars and it can offer it now instead of it taking several days and costing a couple hundreds of dollars, it can offer it for a few dollars and give you a response in just a couple of minutes. And the test here in particular is counting red and white blood cells in a blood sample, which is super helpful for a couple of different uh, cancer treatments like leukemia and other kinds of infectious diseases. And so it's super helpful and streamlines that process, but of course it understands, like they also understand the workflow. It's not just the AI. The AI only works well because they've collected a lot of trained data, fear plus samples in. This is how many uh, red and white blood cells you see in that sample. You train that, and then instead of having a human sit there and count each time, you can automate that process with, uh, again, end-to-end -end trainable deep learning models. I think in general, we will see a lot of improvements in radiology, which is a perfect example of image in, output out, and having a lot of training data for that exact mapping. And so it's kind of surprising to a lot of people because radiology is a job that takes eight to 10 plus years to train for. Uh, and that might actually be easier to automate to some degree. We won't automate all of it. There will always be new kinds of diseases and so on. So we do need radiologists still. Uh, but we can offer a much higher level of service, very fast turnaround, very quick support for radiologists to not miss anything going through previous scans of uh, populations and so on, uh, and really improve the whole field of radiology. All right, so we've covered natural language processing and speech recognition. Now I'll just have one slide on robotics. Uh, and this is starting with a video from uh, the DARPA Grand Challenge in 2015. Uh, where they asked to have these robots, several of which cost uh, quite significant amounts of money, um, to navigate completely autonomously over different environments, different obstacles, different types of uh, ground, of sand, staircases, different, uh, different obstacles they have to open doors to, so find a doorknob, turn around, walk through it. Uh, and as you can see, in 2015, that did not work uh, so well. And in fact, it hasn't really changed that much. Uh, fully autonomous robotics is still incredibly hard and to combine a lot of different skills, visual skills and so on. And uh, is, there, is it pretty hilarious. I, I, I do enjoy this video. That's why I keep, keep having it in there. I'm just gave up. Um, and so, it's really, really hard uh, to do this, and in many ways, we're still behind the level of a honeybee, even, when it comes to complex motor control. Uh, but you also have videos like this one uh, that just came out a couple months ago, and you think, wow, Richard was uh, totally lying. In fact, there's some funny YouTube comments uh, on one of my talks where he was like, I only presented the left video, and people was like, what is he trying to hide? Um, so this one is a video from Boston Dynamics and uh, ends with this amazing backflip and that looks very, very different. Uh, but what you don't see is that there's a person behind the camera with a remote control. So this is not fully autonomous robotics. Uh, but they have figured out a lot of the lower level dynamics to actually make it stabilized and stand and walk and jump and things like that. But it doesn't make autonomous decisions. So again, we're still pretty far away despite making a lot of progress, we're still pretty far away from any of those fun sci-fi scenarios of Terminator. Uh, in fact, what I think is the most interesting manifestation of human intelligence is actually natural language processing. If you think about it, it actually is connected to all the other things that we do. Uh, it's also connected to thought, uh, which is pretty important. And when you close your eyes and you think about running, you can actually, your motor cortex will fire too. So thinking and language connect 
all the other parts of the brain, and it's very distributed and complex kind of machinery, of which we also have a lot less understanding than the visual cortex, for instance, uh, in, in neuroscience. And so there are a bunch of interesting applications, uh, several of which have huge amounts of industries and impact behind them. And I'm not mentioning the obvious ones like advertising and search, which show you that NLP is already the kind of technology that has had a lot more impact than pretty much all of other AI combined in terms of uh, GDP and things like that. So it is still also really hard to do it perfectly, though we are making yeah. a lot of progress. In 2011, uh, people found that whenever Anne Hathaway started a movie, reviews came out, were positive, the stocks for the company Berkshire Hathaway keep going up every time. Start a movie, good reviews, stock went up. Uh, and so this is what we call entity disambiguation problem. And those still persist as you're trying to solve a lot of very general kinds of problems. Uh, but we have made a lot of progress. So this is an output uh, of uh, an algorithm uh, that my group and I developed uh, two years ago. And those are examples that no previous algorithm had correctly classified before, but now the latest uh, of deep learning algorithms can actually accurately identify the right sentiment for these sentences. So the first one is, in its ragged, cheap, and unassuming way, the movie works. So despite being cheap and unassuming and so on, this is actually a positive sentence because the movie makes it work. The second one, the best way to hope for any chance of enjoying this film is by lowering your expectations. Also, really tough because traditional machine learning algorithms would say, well, it's got best and hope and chance and enjoying. How bad could it be? Uh, but then you only get to those once you lower your expectations a lot. And this new algorithm can actually do this accurately. So quite exciting. Uh, another major breakthrough of last year was that we can now, with, again, an end-to-end -end trainable deep learning model, which actually also uses some reinforcement learning, uh, but it's still end-to-end -end trainable, can create summaries of longer documents. And the summarization is still a really tough research problem. This is a particularly good example. They don't all look that good. But uh, the main problem is often the training data. Do we have enough training data? And we need ideally hundreds of thousands of summaries about certain domains. And once you have that, you can build algorithms that can summarize longer documents into shorter ones and actually generate multiple coherent sentences, which was not possible up until last year. The last application uh, and research area that NLP uh, is really excited about, the community of NLP is really excited about, is question answering. And that, of course, is also extremely helpful. Instead of giving just a list of websites that might include your answer, you give the exact answer phrase. And that can be used in service. It can be used in chatbots as a subcomponent where you can allow your chatbots now to ask questions over FAQ sites or knowledge base articles and things like that. So I think in general, we'll see AI augmenting a lot of different kinds of human and informational work. Uh, there's another fun example where you can look at what lawyers are doing, and instead of them spending an hour a day keeping track of how they spend the rest of their day, you can just, based on what they're typing and what documents they're working on, automate that for them. And an hour a day for a lawyer means a lot of money per year for a law firm. So just automating those kinds of things and taking away the, the sort of boring parts of your job, I think will be overall very rewarding. Now, you might ask what you need to make AI work for your own company, and uh, we don't have quite enough time to really go into that. Uh, so I'm just gonna tell you that you gotta think about your data, your algorithms, and your workflows. And in most cases, there's a huge amount of engineering work necessary to get your data all in the right place and have it labeled and basically get it into a format where you have a certain kind of input associated with a certain kind of output that you want to predict. And if you have that, then you're in a really good place because the algorithms, if you use standard, if you have standard kinds of problems, are actually in many ways getting commoditized. The open source uh, community is great and the AI community works a lot open sourcing the ideas uh, in papers and even in code. So unless you try to solve a new kind of problem, your algorithms might not be the problem. And of course, your product teams need to really carefully think through where to actually embed the AI in the general workflow. And so that, I'm going to end with some high-level future thoughts, uh, which I don't think are actually that crazy. So I think food and basic necessities like housing and safety could actually be automated with AI. 
uh, if we, you know, it's not, we're not going to give you like the latest iPad or something <laughs> with AI, but if you just want food, shelter, and things like that, in theory, with the right political structure, <laughs> AI could offer that to everybody. Uh, so if there's still people uh, suffering hunger in the next couple of decades, it's really a political problem and not a technology problem anymore. Uh, I think human intelligence uh, and productivity will get enhanced and in the end, we'll have to focus more and more on unique, creative, and empathetic tasks where you want actually a human to be interacting uh, with you. You don't want an algorithm to do certain things. And the last word is that uh, AI is really only as good as the training data that we give it. And so if your training data is sexist or racist, or any other problem uh, that you might have in your training data that is collected based on human actions, then your algorithms will just take that in and amplify it or reuse it and replicate that kind of behavior. So it's important that we're thinking about diversity both in terms of the kinds of problems that we work on and the kinds of people that are working on these problems, as well as the data sets that the algorithms are trained. Algorithms are always neutral. The image classification algorithm that I've shown you to classify breast cancer or blood samples it can also have a label of shoot, not shoot. There's nothing inherent that we can force these algorithms to not ever do because they just take in their training data and do basically replicate the kinds of patterns that they see there. So hopefully as AI is getting applied to more and more industries, each of these industries like transportation or medicine will have to think about how to regulate it, but it doesn't really make sense to regulate it as an overall thing, just like it's hard to regulate all of computers or all of hammers because those can also all be used for good and bad. So hopefully it's up to you to think about all the positive use cases and make AI uh, improve the state of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, we're getting to the end of the day here and we're gonna wrap it up, I promise, pretty shortly. Uh, I don't know what it was like for you, for us it's been a rush, it's been amazing to have all these people on stage with us and sharing with you some of the latest things they are doing at the forefront. Um, sometimes it feels like we are really hyperbolic and there's massive hype in the space, but at the same time, you know, there are some real changes happening and sometimes it's, it's happening faster than you can think of, it's just happening behind the scene. And so, you know, I think as investors in the space, we see a lot and that's part of the panel's recognition, but uh, we wanted to wrap up the session here with a few highlights, which I'll turn over to Nikolai, um, you know, about what happened today, and then just like tell you a little bit where things are going in your minds. Uh, thank you, Ben, um, and thank you for keeping the show running here on stage all day. Um, so I want to thank all of you to, for coming today and making part of what I personally think was a very successful event. Um, I'm very biased, of course, but a lot of you guys told me in between the sessions today that you've been pretty excited about what happened today. Uh, so I'm the really glad. The part. The coffee is the best part, which <laughs> is uh, our resident Italian Luigi is the one that makes sure that we have real coffee. Of course, he keeps our standard pretty high. <laughs> In the comments, we did the coffee, the real coffee last year, we did it this year, we're going to do it next year, it's not going to go away. Um, so if anything, come back for coffee. Yeah, if, if nothing else. Um, but again, very excited about today. Uh, it's been great for me, and I hope it's, as I said, for you as well. Uh, very excited. And, and I know we're standing between you and alcohol, um, and I grew up in Sweden, and then and you don't want to stand between the Swedes and alcohol for sure. <laughs> um, but anyway, so a few highlights of, 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 of what we talked about today. I think one of the things, um, I want to touch a little bit on the ending notes from, uh, from Richard, which was, we should not regulate AI. And the reason for that is that it's a generic technology. We need to look at where it's applied and how that matters. And today, there's starting to be talk about, need it, is it dangerous to be regulated? Uh, so, so dangerous should be regulated, right? Maybe it is, maybe where it's applied. But I think to, for, to what Paul said er, uh, early this morning was that AI is not a vertical, it's not one thing. It's like we've seen with other technologies like the internet and computers, it's an alpha trend. 
it will transcend everything and it will shape everything. Um, I don't think that's important to remember. That's what we care about. That's what we think is so big. We think this is really the fourth wave of industrial revolution. Um, but it also needs to apply in something that matters, which is why we talk about applied AI, right? Well, um, believe it or not, three years ago, it was all AI. Nobody talked about applied AI and for us as investors to say, look, unless it's being applied, practically speaking, in the next three to five years, it doesn't matter, right, from an adventure investment standpoint. Yeah, and I think that's going back to how we talk internally, when we talk about the conference, there are three pillars that we build the content and thinking around this, and it's, it's how AI is impacting people, organizations, and society as a whole. Um, and we try to build content and narrative and, and what we do with during this conference around those things. I want to mention a few other things, and these are some of the verticals that we really care about where we see a lot of uh, exciting things happening with AI. So the future of work, uh, somebody said that human work will focus, will shift to creative topics engaging with humans, so the communication between humans and the creativity. And I think this is important to remember that AI is, is highly disruptive, but it doesn't mean we're going to replace humans. But as we've seen with every other technology in the past, over 100 years of, of innovation and industrialization is that it shifts the job, jobs you do. It also shifts very clearly to increase specialization. And there are things with AI that we never could even think about having computers and machines to do, but they're also going to be able to augment to do things that humans never could do. And that combination, we believe, is extremely powerful augmenting human capability. Right? Uh, so that's what we think the future work is going to be a lot about. We talked a little bit about energy, and, and I think I'm, I'm repeating a little bit what I said uh, on stage then, uh, to, together with Thomas uh, from energy, uh, is that energy, it's you know electricity. We're so used to it just working. right? But we're shifting dramatically how it's generated, where it's generated, how we consume it, that this is actually becoming really complex problems, which actually need AI um, to be able to both be cost effective and reliable, um, and actually secure. Uh, there is threats from different actors that can disrupt the grids, and there's a lot of issues around this, really important for our society. And another area, sounds like I'm, I'm very dystopian here, well, you're always anticipating the next slide. I'm wondering if you're AI powered, but. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, let's talk about cybersecurity. Uh, so, Penn talked a little bit about how passwords are not enough. Um, and, I don't know. Uh, to me, the past two years, from data breaches with Equifax to an election or two or things around the world, uh, I think it's pretty apparent that we need to live in a world where even. Things like social media that we find, might not think is as point and secure as our bank accounts or other things, they actually, when you don't know who is actually impacting them, when you don't know what person really is behind attri attributing and behind what's going on, it can be abused, really, with really severe consequences, right? This is really important. Um, and again, it's also a complex problem where as we are seeing it, we are already invested in companies like PIN, which are using AI to be able to do that and achieve that. Right? Well, I love the part where you don't have to memorize your PIN and change it every two weeks. Yeah. Well, I don't like a password. You know, if the systems just know it's me, it's fine. Right? Um, and then I think I want to touch on the last point uh, that uh, Dr. Jane McFarlane spoke about, is that, you know, we're increasingly going to a world where we're talking about um, autonomous transportation. We're talking about, uh, we, have, we, have, we have, the cities of the world are becoming, you know, we're almost, you know, there's a migration into the cities. 200,000 people move into cities every day around the world. Yeah. 200,000. We're moving more and more into cities and urban areas. And so it's going to get worse, not better, unless we solve this problem. And if you lived in Bay Area for, for, for the past 10 years, you probably think about this more or less every day, driving up and down 101. It just gets worse and worse and worse, right? So as a long story short, uh, to solve some of these major infrastructure problems, and from energy to actually moving people and things around, um, 
Right now, we're sitting on data silos where Apple has one part of its data set to be able to solve some real problems around this. And the, the decades of planning with that the transport authorities does, the Caltrans of California and others, and, and, and Google sits on another one, and the, the Department of Transportation is on yet another one. Uh, building better collaboration between both public and private, I think that's going to be crucial across the board to be able to you know, keep innovating and having a society that's thriving with everything that's happening. Um, and I think I'm still on topic, oh. I think the... <laughs> Let's go back. This okay. No, it's good. No, no, it's fine. Um, you went to Google. So, I mean, look, recently the CEO of Google said this is one of the most fundamental technology out there, maybe as, as impactful as fire or electricity. Uh, and then, of course, you know, everybody loves to quote that guy. Where she says, hey, by the way, yeah, this is, this is amazing. And by the way, it's got to be actually as worse than nukes, mark my words. Um, and I think, you know, of course the media loves it because they, they want to feed on that and they want to remind people that, you know, like, I think like Richard Sasha said best, he said, look, technology is neutral. Yeah. It is what we make of it that turns it into good or evil. And, and I think, you know, we think a lot about that. Um, you know, earlier, and, you know, to maybe wrap up around that, it's like, you know, Paul mentioned, uh, and Accenture said, look, you know, 38% productivity improvement uh, and, and trillions of dollars of impact to the economy. I mean, we're not talking small numbers. Um, so it would matter to a lot of people. But I think, interestingly, you, the conversation here, the fact that you are here, you know, for the first time, I think people are a lot more excited and intrigued and careful about how we deploy this technology than prior technology. I don't think you have seen the same level of engagement of people around the mobile or the internet itself. So actually, I take that as a good thing, and I think, you know, uh, we certainly care about bringing people together. So, like Nikolai said, we just don't know yet what the impact of that new technology is going to be on people, organization, and society. Uh, but what we do know is that unless we bring it forth in front of you, and we have this conversation openly and telling you what works, what doesn't work, what are the challenges, and we're not going to move forward in a way that is positive. Uh, but like Nikolai said, if you think about society today, everything is digitalizing. And I mean everything. Every single sector, every single aspect of your lives, every single businesses. And, and that also means that it becomes more vulnerable as well. Because again, it's not been built and designed from the ground up to be secured in a way that we would expect things in the physical world to be secured. Right? And so, you know, of course in San Francisco I couldn't help myself to quote this. <laughs> With great powers come great responsibilities. You need a quote from Spider-Man. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and Richard, you know, he almost stole the closing here, but uh, you know, we really think alike, and we're so privileged to, to be a friend and having him on stage, you know, several years in a row with us, actually, I think, he's done all three conferences. Um, but we are the architects of our future. Don't look to point the fingers at others. What are you doing? We're all designing our futures. The founders out there design the futures. And, and so, like Nikolai said, let's not go build a world where we pit machines against humans. This is not the world that I want my children to grow up in. This is not the world I want to invest in. You know, let's build a world where we actually have human augmented machines, where you know, maybe they would do 80% of the work tomorrow, from 20% today to 80%, and we do the rest. But that doesn't mean that they do everything and we do the rest. It means that we're collaborating together and do things that we couldn't do before. So, and, 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 and to jump in on that, right, it's, it's, and it's not only there's a moral and ethic piece of this, but it's also what we, we've seen already in our portfolio of, of AI companies is that this augmentation of humans, the combination of having machines do what they do best with AI and having humans do what they do best and combine that in a very deliberate um, an efficient way actually creates orders of magnitudes in scale and quality output, right? So, so bottom line, you build more successful, more valuable companies if you figure out how to do this well as well. So I'm sure you were not expecting a quote from Michael Jackson, but <laughs> if you think about it... Well, we've got yeah. Spider-Man, we've got a Michael Jackson. Well, you know, it's like if you want to make the world a better place, just, you know, take a look at, at yourself and make a change. And I think that was such powerful lyrics. And, 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 you know, in the context of venture capitalists, we say, well, we kind of have the same, but we play it a bit differently. We say, you know what? If you see a founder that's investing in the future you want to see in the world, invest in them, right? Because ultimately, people are changing the future by making it happen now. And so with that, you know, at Bootstrap Lab, we just happen to be 
and covering the future by investing in Playa. And with that, thank you so much. And let's go have a drink next Thank time. you, guys. Anyway, a big, big thank you to everybody. Yeah, we don't mind. Okay, so we also want to, you know, a big thank you to the rest of the team. So yeah. I can take no credit for this amazing conference. Ben has been amazing today. Luigi, Mark, Ed, and, and Dana, Dana and, and Kevin, and the whole production so team. All of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, Michael, uh, what did you think of the conference? It was amazing to me. To me, it was uh, an amazing conference. A lot of great people convening, a lot of information in one day. Yeah. And uh, lots to learn about how AI is going to affect everything uh, that we do and how we live and how work uh, operates and businesses. So, I'm well, glad, same I'm glad here. I attended. Same here. I enjoyed uh, meeting you. Thank yeah. you. A pleasure to meet you.